Hello everyone, this is Eric, the Asian movie enthusiast. Now if you're familiar with this YouTube channel, you know that I've been reviewing Asian horror films for the past few years, over 600 titles to date, in chronological order, going all the way back to the 1950s. Now I will include a link in the description box below to my Asian horror year in review playlist for anyone who is interested in checking out those reviews. This video is my first official opinion piece on this channel, and it's going to address some popular questions that are usually phrased in a rhetorical manner. Is Japanese horror dead? What happened to Japanese horror films? And why is there no diversity in the Japanese horror film industry since they just keep producing films about ghost girls with wet hair over their faces? Well, if the answers to any of these questions interest you, grab a drink, and stick around for a while. Now, in conjunction with answering those aforementioned questions, this video is also a response to a very relevant internet article with the title, The Death of J-Horror. It was written by a man named Nicholas Ruka and was published on a website known as Midnight Eye. Now, the article is available for reading. I'll include a link in the description box below, of course. Now, I'm a big fan of the contributors of that website, and I personally own four of their published books on Japanese cinema, written by Tom S. or Jasper Sharp, and I've recommended them multiple times on my YouTube channel. Unfortunately, the article in question is one of Midnight Eye's least convincing writings, for a variety of reasons that I will argue later on. Now, this article was published on December 22nd, 2005, and I can only assume that your first question would be, Eric, What's the point in responding to an article that was published over 12 years ago? Well, my response would be that there are multiple reasons for such an endeavor. First, the main argument of this article is the claim that was used frequently when it was initially published, but continues to be used up to the present day. The assertion that J-horror is dead is tossed around quite often when the topic of Japanese horror is being discussed. So responding to this article from 2005 is essentially the same thing as responding to present-day criticisms, meaning that this exercise is still entirely relevant. Second, this situation gives us ample opportunity to assess the Japanese horror films that were released in the years directly preceding and following the article's publication in order to more comprehensively determine if the popular opinion that J-horror is dead is actually convincing. Now, if the Japanese horror industry did die all of those years ago, then we should be easily, we should easily see this when analyzing industry trends in subsequent years. And finally, I do not think anyone on YouTube has actually taken the time to do a project like this. You know, I like to try things that no other YouTuber has ever done, you know, like reviewing 86 Takashi Miike films or 600 Asian horror films. This video is another analysis that I don't believe has ever been done before on this website. So hopefully it will be useful and informative to everyone and you'll get a bunch of movie recommendations along the way. Now I had to put a little bit of thought into how I wanted to structure this video because you know, the article that I'm responding to is a little bit confusing. You know, I wanted this response video to be more organized and neat. So this is what I'm gonna do. First, I'm going to respond to the main question at hand. Is Japanese horror dead? That's probably the reason why you clicked on this video, so I'm going to address that question first. After that, I'm going to respond to a variety of statements within the Midnight Eye article itself, almost all of which relate specifically to the Japanese horror film industry. Now, this is going to be a long video, but trust me, it's necessary. The topics that I'm exploring need to be thoroughly addressed, since no one else on this website has bothered to do it. Uh, you know, I've taken the responsibility to do it myself. So let's get started by taking a look at some uh, specific quotes from the Midnight Eye article that nicely summarize the, the widespread perception of the Japanese horror film industry by most movie fans, and uh, will also provide an excellent launching point for my attempt to address the aforementioned questions. So please note that the page numbers that I reference will approximate the page numbers that would result from printing out the article. So why did the Midnight Eye contributors think that J-Horror was dead when they published this article way back on December 22nd, 2005? Furthermore, I'm going to be upfront about why I've written this feature article. I am totally tired of the J-Horror releases that have come out recently. 
Last April, after sitting through another onslaught of these new releases, I decided that I had had enough and needed to get it off my chest. I've taken, it's taken me a while to formulate my thoughts and get them down, but in a sense this piece is me drawing a line in the sand and demanding that the producers allow or force their filmmakers to work in a creative manner and put an end to the obsessive sequel making and regurgitation of the Shinri Mano Ega ghost film that is dragging down Japanese film, and Hollywood horror for that matter. How many times can you see a ghost woman that looked like they had just jumped out of a sh very cold shower and really care? Part of the problem with J-horror, my belief, is that the market has killed it. We have all been so inundated with A, B, and Z-rated knockoffs. From Hideo Nakata's original Ring alone, we have Ring 2, Ring 0, The Ring US, The Ring 2 US, and The Korean Ring Virus. And I just mentioned the insanity of the Juon explosion, that are full of the genre cliches, and there is no desire for any creativity anymore. In fact, you'd have thought that instead of a circulating cursed videotape that killed people, it was a cursed tape that made people put out uninspired cash-ins on lame stories. Try something different, folks. Well, it's fairly obvious what this man is arguing, right? The Japanese horror film industry, as of the end of 2005, was suffering from a severe lack of creativity. You know, the industry was oversaturated with ghost films, and filmmakers were failing miserably to create much of anything outside of that narrow subgenre. I mean, for goodness sakes, try something different, folks. Well, this sounds pretty serious, but there's a very important nuance that I need to point out before responding to these statements. Now, the author of this article and the Midnight Eye contributors in general have a very narrow-minded idea of what constitutes J-horror. According to this article, the term J-horror is used to describe contemporary Japanese ghost films only. Now, you know, I've been reading articles and participating in message board conversations for over a decade, and in most cases, J-horror is simply used as shorthand for Japanese horror. When referring to cinema, J-horror is typically inclusive of every Japanese horror film ever made, and that's why in online discussions regarding J-horror, you know, the films Quieten and Onibaba are frequently mentioned, two films that were released way back in the mid-1960s. Now, I will address this point in more detail when we reach section two of this video, but it's obvious to me that the author's de definition of J-horror is lacking in both common sense and practicality. But more importantly, it creates serious confusion on the part of the reader, because you're never really sure if the author is specifically criticizing filmmakers and producers of ghost films, or if he's criticizing the entire Japanese horror film industry. Now, after rereading this article, dozens of times over the years, I've come to the conclusion that he is, in fact, criticizing both. But even if we place the semantic problems of this article aside for a moment, it's a fact that a lot of people out there think that Japanese horror is dominated by ghost films and little else. So again, my response to this line of argumentation is entirely relevant because it appears to be a widespread assumption that has been adopted by most movie fans. So. If the industry was truly in a state of creative atrophy, we should have an incredibly difficult time finding horror films that do not revolve around ghosts. And since this article was written on December 22nd, 2005, at the end of that year, it should be damn near impossible to find any non-ghost films from the years that immediately preceded. I mean, we were getting so many Z-rated ring knockoffs that this writer had to draw a line in the sand and write a 12-page dissertation on the subject just to get it off his chest. So let's take a look and see if we can find any Japanese horror films from 2005 that do not revolve around ghosts. Strange Circus, a story of incest and violence that inspires a wheelchair-bound writer to write an edgy, erotic novel. Rampo Noir, an anthology of four macabre short films that rely on vivid imagery and grotesque violence. Story one, with an absolute silence, a naked man wanders through a dark and depressing landscape, recalling the excruciating details of his last encounter with his former lover. Story two, when a series of women are discovered with their faces burnt and skulls charred, a young detective investigates, 
discovering that a unique hand mirror is always found at the scene. Story 3. A war hero returns home with no limbs and only his eyesight remaining. His beautiful wife, tired of taking care of him, turns to torturing her crippled husband for amusement. And Story 4. A sexy actress is returning home from a successful night on stage until her limo driver decides that she should be coming home with him instead. Meatball Machine. Parasites invade human bodies, turning them into cyborg-like killing machines, called Necroborgs, biomechanical monsters who can transform their own flesh into weaponry. Neighbor number 13. A man suffered all kinds of abuse from his classmates as a child, which permanently scarred his personality. Now, as an adult, he has developed a terrifying alter ego who retaliates against those who wrong him. Haze, a man wakes up, bleeding from his abdomen, with a maze of extremely dangerous crawl spaces. The Kazuo Umezu Manga Horror Theater film franchise, a project of six movies that are based on the works of Kazuo Umezu. Here's a short synopsis for each film. Present, college students are having a sexy, festive time at a desolate hotel during the Christmas season, that is, until Santa Claus shows up. House of Bugs. In this story about an unfaithful couple, the husband believes his cheating wife may no longer be human. Wish. Seeking companionship, a little boy and his puppet doll become best playmates, and that is, until the doll gets agitated. Diet. A girl tries to impress a boy by going on an extreme diet. All goes well at first, but the mental stress gets the best of her. Deathmake. A group of psychics agree to shoot a documentary inside an old building, unaware of the dangers that lie within. Snake Girl. This is about a girl who visits her cousin in a remote town, only to discover strange occurrences involving snakes and curses. Egg. A woman of mixed lineage sees visions of an egg in her head, which eventually leads to violent encounters with a monstrous apparition. Tokyo Zombie. Two slackers murder their boss and dump his body in a toxic waste dump known as Black Fuji. Things suddenly become worse when an army of the undead rises from the waste dump and begin to attack the living. Id. This one is about a group of degenerate villagers who beat, rape, and abuse other people. Gurozuka. A small group of college girls travel to a desolate house in the woods to shoot a horror movie but they are targeted by a murderer who wears a no-mask and uses a meat cleaver as a weapon. White Panic One day, when four young people, three men and a woman, wake up in the morning, they find themselves in a small room filled with white powder, naked. Zoo, an anthology of five short films. Story one is about twin sisters, one loved and one hated, who are physically abused by their mother. Story two is about a kidnapped boy and his sister who attempt to elude a killer while trapped within a series of interconnected concrete rooms. In story three, a young boy's father is convinced that his mother is dead, and the mother is convinced that the father is dead. The boy is the only person that both father and mother can see. Story four is about a scientist who creates a girl android to serve him in his rural home. And story five is about a murderer who stashes a dead body at an abandoned zoo and returns to visit it on a nightly basis. Last Supper One night, a plastic surgeon takes home some leftover fat from a liposuction procedure and fries it up for dinner. This taste of forbidden flesh fuels his desires, and he soon embarks on a killing spree to acquire fresh meat. Now, let's take a look and see if we can find any Japanese horror films from 2004 that do not revolve around ghosts. Because I think this will also be helpful to get a greater picture of what was going on in the industry since this is the year that directly precedes the year of the article's publication. Maribito, a photographer frees a beautiful woman who is chained to a rock face during his search for terror in the deep underground of Tokyo, only to later discover her abnormalities. Dead girl walking. A girl's body dies, but her mind continues to function resulting in her gradual transformation into the undead. Late Bloomer. A man with cerebral palsy grows severely frustrated with his own existence 
and resorts to violence against others. Prayer Beads, an anthology of nine films, eight of which have nothing to do with ghosts. This includes a story about three college students who get lost in a forest and come across a witch who grows delicious mushrooms, as well as a story about a psychic child's relationship with an army of seals who visit the nearby riverbed. The Boy from Hell. A woman resurrects her dead son as a half-decomposed inhuman who needs fresh human organs to survive. Concrete. This film is based on the true story of a 16-year-old high school girl who was abducted, tortured, raped, and murdered during 44 days of captivity. Ravaged House. In a rural village, there lives a man with his sister. All is well until one day... The man becomes infected with a bizarre disease that blisters his skin and deforms his body. Lizard Baby. A woman gives birth to a half-human, half-lizard son. Elevator, The Bottled Fools. Taking place in a strange underground world of the future, a psychic schoolgirl and some random passengers get trapped inside of an elevator, after which violence ensues. Box, from the Three Extremes Anthology. This recounts the recurring dreams of a woman whose twin sister died when she was working as a circus performer in her childhood years. And it's important to note that the vast majority of the aforementioned films have had legitimate English language subtitled releases, with only a few having limited availability as non-subtitled Japanese DVDs. So now that we've taken a detailed look at the production trends, of the Japanese horror film industry from 2005 and 2004, it seems fairly obvious that there are plenty of titles here that have little to nothing to do with ghosts. Now, I've covered these production trends in the Asian horror playlist before on my channel, and in that playlist, we saw that the production and availability of Japanese horror films exploded in 2004 and subsequent years. And even more importantly, we also saw that the variety of Japanese horror films increased during that era. So it would seem that the industry really is not at fault here. The problem lies with those people, and there are many of them, who like to toss around the assertion that Japanese horror is dead, but don't even really bother to do research on what kinds of films are actually being produced. Even the contributors of the Midnight Eye website, you know, a website that is usually very well informed regarding Japanese cinema, decided to publish an article lambasting in the creativity of an industry right in the middle of a creative explosion. And even if we accept their severely narrow-minded definition of J-horror, and just assume that they were really only criticizing the directors and producers who make ghost films, the fact remains that this is a 12-page article entitled The Death of J-horror that omits almost every single non-ghost horror film that was produced in 2004 and 2005. And that, my friends, is an incredibly misleading and inaccurate description of the Japanese film industry. Now, to be fair, that may not have been entirely their fault, because you know, I've mentioned plenty of times on this YouTube channel that I personally need a minimum of two to three years before I can even remotely assess a particular year in an Asian film industry. You know, and that's because I'm based in the United States and it takes a while to get legitimate releases. And with that said, the Midnight Eye contributors seem to have unusually good access to Japanese films, which is evident in their yearly best and worst lists. But the writer for this article seemed to be based in the United States, so there is a possibility that he did not have the chance to watch most of these films by the end of 2005, which is probably why he only mentions one of them in his article, Maribito. But I'm sorry. That does not change the fact that December of 2005 is probably the worst possible time to publish an article about the death of Jay Hoare. He literally could not have chosen a worse time to publish this article because it was right in the midst of an industry that was churning out a variety of horror films. 2005 was a truly exceptional year in an industry that was churning out you know, tons of production and diversity. So much so that I find it difficult if not impossible, to find any other year in the history of Japanese horror cinema that's comparable to this year. So the timing of this publication in and of itself severely undermines the foundation of the article. You know, if Japanese filmmakers are really producing too many ghost films, we wouldn't have all of these other films to watch. 
And those are just the ones that I've seen. You know, I'm sure there are more floating around out there. But at one point, you know, at one point while compiling this list, this list, I did ask myself a question. What if this many movies is not enough? You know, what's the exact number of non-ghost films that Japan has to produce and make available to international audiences to reasonably avoid this kind of criticism? And after much thought on attempting to nail down a specific number, I eventually came to the conclusion that the solution is not numerical. It's practical. See, my aforementioned list has to be enough. Because very few people are actually going to sit down and watch all of those movies. And I can assure you that most critics of Japanese horror have not seen most of the aforementioned films. Even diehard fans would have difficulty finding the time to sit down and watch them all. But with that said, I would not be surprised if a, a small handful of my YouTube subscribers have accomplished that feat. I mean, I've seen them all, so it's not impossible or anything. But it would be interesting to see if anybody's seen them all. But the practical conclusion is elementary. Japan releases so many non-ghost horror films to shake a stick at. I mean, they release so many that the vast majority of movie fans would never even make the time commitment to sit down and watch most of them, let alone all of them. And yet, we keep hearing complaints and criticisms on the internet that Japan doesn't make enough of them. It's the equivalent of someone being served a 10-course meal, but then complains that there's not enough food despite the fact that they've never even bothered to finish the first three courses. It makes no logical sense. And I want to stress something else that's very important here. These industry trends are independent of whether, whether anyone actually likes these films or not. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I certainly did not enjoy all of the films that I just mentioned. You know what I mean? I liked most of them to varying degrees, but not all of them. You know, a few of them I think are crap. You may have seen a bunch of those films and disliked some or most of them. In fact, if you came to me and said, hey Eric, you know, I, I sat down and I watched a bunch of the movies that you listed out here tonight, and most of them, you know, they simply did not work for me. You know, here are the specific reasons why I disliked each film, and here are some of the trends in the industry that I'm seeing that I generally dislike. I'm not, I'm not liking what I'm seeing here. If you told me that, I got no problem with it. You know, that's a perfectly legitimate opinion to have. What works for some people in a horror film may not work for others. But that is not the point of this Midnight Eye article, and it's not the point that's brought up by most people who criticize contemporary Japanese horror films. You know, this author spends very little time talking about what he specifically dislikes about the Japanese horror films that he's actually seen. You know, despite his rather confusing definition of J-horror, the aforementioned quotes I cited near the beginning of this video are a perfect representation of why most people think of, of what most people think of the industry. You know, most people think that Japanese horror films suffer from a severe lack of creativity. The industry is oversaturated with ghost films, and filmmakers fail miserably to create much of anything outside of that narrow subgenre. Now, that claim is far more objective than disliking the films themselves. Problem is that this argument becomes incredibly unconvincing when we take the time to inform ourselves of the films that were actually produced. Now, does Japan produce a bunch of ghost films? Do they? Of course they do. Some of them are great. Some of them are good. Some of them are not so good. And some of them are freaking awful. Right? So yes, there are a bunch of Japanese ghost films out there for you to watch as well. But that does not change the fact that you could still completely ignore those ghost films and keep yourself very busy for a long time watching all of the other kinds of films that Japan produces. And with all of that said, you know, I have personally criticized the Japanese horror film industry from the late 90s and early 2000s. In my videos that covered 2003 specifically, I aggressively criticized the industry because I disliked the vast majority of films that came out that year. You know, my criticisms were focused primarily on the overall quality of the films, but we did observe that, you know, the creativity of the Japanese horror film industry from, say, 2001 to 2003 was not quite as strong as 2004, 2005, and subsequent years. I mean, sure, they did produce films like Gozu, Suicide Club, and Stacy, Attack of the Schoolgirl Zombies in the early 2000s, but the diversity of the horror production was not as impressive when compared to 2004, 2005, and subsequent years. So you know what, maybe I'm, 
you know, maybe I'm being a bit too hard on these guys that, at Midnight Eye, right? Maybe this Death of J-Hor article was, you know, suffering from a combination of a lag effect and bad timing, which is a possibility. You know, maybe they were using their knowledge of the industry from the early 2000s and published an article about it smack dab in the middle of an upsurge in creativity that they had not yet realized. I mean, it is a possibility. Now, I previously mentioned that the contributors at Midnight Eye typically know their stuff, and it would seem that they got a whiff of this creative explosion within the Japanese horror film industry a mere five months after the publication of their article of the death of J-Horror. So Tom Mess makes the following statements in his review of Strange Circus, which was published on May 3rd of 2006. Now, we've signaled it before in these pages. The fantastique in Japanese film is undergoing a radical metamorphosis. J-Horror was living on borrowed time, a corpse temporarily reanimated with foreign blood after its initial death five years ago, but now decaying so badly that all it can muster is an occasional twitch and spasm. Instead, the nation's filmmakers are looking elsewhere for inspiration, to a past that offered a more full-blooded, garish, wild, unrestrained, even celebratory, a celebratory way of looking at the dark side of humanity. Iro Guro is back. Takashi Miike's contribution to the Asian horror omnibus Three Extremes, Box, already signaled the direction, while Shinya Tsukamoto was, as usual, way ahead of the crowd with 1999's Gemini, Soseiji, an adaptation of a short story by the single most important figure in the Iro Guro tradition, Edogawa Rampo. But it, it is the glee and the vibrancy of last year's magnificent Rampo Noir that seems to have acted like a sort of cold shower, an unexpected shock at first, but one that kick-started the circulation and made the juices flow again. Suddenly, Iro Guro themed productions were lining up to be unleashed under the unsuspecting audience, Hisuyasu Sato's Shize the Tattooer, based on the first published work by Rampo's equally kinky colleague and contemporary Juno, Junichiro Tanizaki, Miki's U.S. financed imprint and Suicide Club director Sion Sono's aptly titled Strange Circus. So Rampo Noir was published on the Midnight Eye website, the review of this movie, on December 22nd of 2005, the very same day that their Death of j Hor article came out. Now, it's quite ironic that they publish a review of a magnificent horror film on the very same day that they insinuate that the, jet, that the industry is struggling and being weighed down by an overproduction of ghost films. Even more ironic is that they start name-dropping other non-ghost horror films like Box, Imprint, and Strange Circus mere months after publishing their Death of J-Horror article. So every, every time a non-ghost horror film comes to light, it adds another data point in the growing line of evidence that undermines their very own arguments. But on a positive note, you know, maybe they began to see the light here. You know, maybe this Death of J-Horror article was a, was a mistake. You know, a regrettable oversight that would be rectified with a subsequent article that proclaimed the rebirth of J-Horror. Maybe they would revise their definition of J-Horror to be more expansive and representative of the industry as a whole. You know, maybe they would rename it J-Horror 2.0 and draw attention to the other 24 movies that I previously mentioned from 2004 and 2005. I mean, they did identify 4 out of 28, which isn't much, but it's a start. And I guarantee you that 95% of people on the internet who think that J-Horror is dead and all J-Horror films have ghost girls in them don't even know that the film Rampo Noir exists. Now, digging yourself out of a hole of ignorance does take a little bit of effort, but if anyone can help the masses by informing them of industry trends, it's Tom Mess. So let's fast forward to 2010. Now, at this point, these guys at Midnight Eye, as well as everyone else in the world, has had you know, a long five years, a very long five years, to catch up on a bunch of the non-ghost horror films from 2004 and 2005. And these guys are so good at what they do. They're so well informed. I bet that the next time they reference the J-horror film industry, they're going to name drop a bunch more of these non-ghost films that I laid out earlier and admit that, you know, in retrospect, the production of ghost films was not quite as debilitating as they had initially assumed. 
And I just so happened to have an article from 2010 that was published in Tom Mess's excellent book, Re-Agitator, where he references the Japanese horror film industry while discussing the Jay Gore films that exploded onto the scene in 2008. So let's see what he has to say. Japanese ghosts, anyone? Anyone? No hands raised? Figured as much. J-Horror, that buzzword from the early stages of the millennium, has died its second death, more permanent than the first one. Nothing more harmful for a ghost, even a long-haired one, than being ubiquitous. Wither, then, the ever-evolving horror genre in Japan, for nearly two decades, Sadako and her ilk reigned supreme. There was a brief resurgence to the elegant tradition of erotic grotesque, Iroguro, in the shape of Shion Sono's strange circus, Akio Jisoji's Rampo Noir and Takashi Miike's episodes in Three Extremes in Masters of Horror. But the opulent style associated with Iroguro is not a viable model for a film industry in crisis, making do with dwindling budgets. Well, that was disappointing. So this guy publishes an article in 2010 and mentions the same small handful of films that he mentioned in an article way back in 2006, along with a handful of Japanese gore films like Tokyo Gore Police that were released in 2008 and subsequent years. It's like those other 24 films that I mentioned from 2004 and 2005 were magically erased from existence. And I understand that the purpose of this 2010 article was to shine a spotlight on these Japanese gore films, not to provide a comprehensive update on production trends, but this is a very sketchy and imprecise description of the horror landscape in Japan. Now he first states that, for nearly two decades, Sadako and her ilk reigned supreme. Then he insinuates that there was like a brief resurgence of erotic grotesque films before the recent Jay Gore trend. And he just leaves it at that. I'm not sure what it is about the Japanese horror film industry that brings out the laziest aspects of those who write about it. But this is a surprisingly lethargic, hand-waving dismissal of an entire industry by one of the most knowledgeable English language writers of Japanese film. But he's not the only one. You know, I've been reading crap like this on the internet for over 10 years. You know, this is the same nonsense I've been reading on message boards, Facebook posts, and YouTube comment sections for ages. You know, stuff like, man, if you've seen one Japanese horror film, I mean, you've seen them all. I mean, really. How many times can you see a ghost girl who looks like she just jumped out of a very cold shower and really care, right? Meanwhile, a DVD copy of Strange Circus is collecting dust in an Amazon warehouse somewhere because people are too lazy to do a simple internet search on what Japanese horror films are being produced. And believe it or not, most people on the internet in 2018 still believe that the Japanese horror film industry suffers from a severe lack of creativity and that the industry is still oversaturated with ghost films, and filmmakers are still failing miserably to create much of anything outside of that narrow subgenre. Okay. So, let's fast forward 12 long years after this Death of J-Horror article was published. So reading most of the internet coverage on Japanese horror films nowadays, and there's really not much, would make you believe that Japan has not produced a relevant non-ghost horror film since audition back in 1999. You know, even those occasional internet articles and YouTube videos that kind of pop up out of nowhere, and, uh, you know, they pop up and try to encourage people to, to recommend Japanese horror films uh, to watch, they usually end up recommending the same handful of films that everyone has known about for ages. You know, Ring, Dark Water, The Grudge, etc. Then you have people on message boards just looking around aimlessly, asking questions like, what happened to Japanese horror? Or even worse, people who like to criticize the industry out of ignorance say stuff like, it's not like Japan has made much of anything since the horror boom back in the day. And these statements are almost always paired with like this pretentious attitude of people who are you know, seemingly looking down on the Japanese industry as if we're a homeless child desperately begging for food, you know? And these criticisms of the industry are frequently presented as matter-of-fact statements that lack any kind of detailed analysis or research that actually backs them up. Because everyone already knows that the Japanese horror film industry died way back in the early 2000s. You know, there's no point in suffering the inconvenience of having to do any actual research on the subject. And it's simply a widely accepted fact. Alright, 
So let's take a look and see if we can find any Japanese horror films from 2006 and subsequent years that do not revolve around ghosts. I really should not have to do this, but I think it's obvious at this point that there, is a lot of, there are a lot of misconceptions out there regarding the Japanese horror film industry. So I'm going to rectify some of that this evening because no one else is apparently going to do it. It's so much easier for everyone just to sit back with a beer in hand, talk with their buddies about how much everything sucks, without ever bothering to put the time or the effort into actually substantiating their arguments. And most of the time, you could get away with that sort of thing. Not tonight. Sorry. So, if we're to believe what everyone on the internet is saying, and I mean everyone, this list should be, sh should be insanely short. I mean, there's no way... I could come up with like, you know, 50 such films or somewhere around there. Because as we all know, the Japanese horror film industry completely collapsed after that J-horror boom all those years ago. So, let's do this. This should take about like 30 seconds. Alright. Imprint from 2006. Set in 19th century Japan, this follows an American journalist searching for a prostitute he loved yet forsook years ago. During an encounter with a disfigured hooker, he learns of the unspeakably cruel fate that his love suffered. Forbidden Siren, we're still in 2006, the inhabitants of a solitary island of Yamajima seem to have disappeared, but searchers find one person who give a mysterious warning, when you hear the siren, never go out. God's Left Hand, Devil's Right Hand, 2006, after her psychic brother falls into a coma, a girl attempts to use his clues to catch a serial killer, a man who draws their deaths in a picture book for his seven-year-old daughter to read at night. Nightmare Detective from 2006. A policewoman investigates a mysterious pair of suicides and eventually seeks the help of a detective who can enter people's dreams. The Girls' Rebel Force of Competitive Swimmers, 2007. A high school girls swim team fight off a legion of zombies that have spread throughout their school. X-Cross, 2007. Two schoolgirls travel to a remote spa for relaxation, but end up running from murderous lunatic townspeople who perform rituals by dismembering women's legs, as well as a demented, one-eyed Lolita goth chick armed with massive scissors. Sanguiverous, the official release date of which is debatable, but it likely hit film festivals at some point in 2007 or 2008 before finally being released on DVD in the United States in 2011. Now this is a mostly black and white, mostly silent film about a young woman and her boyfriend who cross paths with a duo of vampires. Let me repeat that. From an industry that produces nothing but ghost films, we have a mostly black and white, mostly silent film about vampires. High school girl... High School Rika Zombie Hunter, 2008. When, when Rika and her friend decide to ditch school in order to visit her grandfather outside of the city, they learn that the town has been plagued by some sort of zombie outbreak. Twilight Syndrome, Dead Cruise, 2008. Honor students on a senior cruise get trapped in an alternate reality game brought on board by their vindictive classmate. Tamami, The Baby's Curse, also from 2008. A teenaged orphan girl suddenly learns that she's actually not an orphan and will be moving back in with her birth family, waiting for her in a mansion that all the townsfolk think are haunt is haunted is an insane mother and an evil housekeeper and a mutant baby monster, of course. Tokyo Gore Police, 2008. A mad scientist known as the Key Man has created a virus that mutates humans into monstrous creatures called engineers. Genetically modified supercriminals who can transform open flesh wounds into flesh metal weaponry. Grotesque, 2009. An unnamed doctor has always had everything he's ever wanted, but that has only made him develop more extreme and depraved needs. He kidnaps a young couple in their prime of their life and forces them into a game of torment that slowly extinguishes their hopes for survival. Blood, 2009. A detective investigates a cold case murder, but becomes embroiled in a vampire feud. Tetsuo the Bullet Man, 2009. Losing his son in a hit and run triggers violent emotions in a man whose body begins to transform. 
When the driver who killed his son reappears, the father mutates into a mass of metal, a human weapon fueled by an uncontrollable rage. Occult 2009 After a murder at a Japanese resort, a survivor claims that supernatural occurrences, which he calls miracles, have been happening to him since the incident, including a UFO-like object hovering in the sky. Black Rat 2010 Six classmates receive an email from Asuka, who supposedly committed suicide. Later that night, they all get together in a classroom and are surprised by a person wearing a bloody rat mask. Hell Driver, 2010. A young girl is abused by her mother and uncle. Luckily for her, a meteorite falls from the sky, hits her mother, and destroys her heart. But then she becomes a demon and rips the girl's heart out, transplanting it into her own chest. Insanity follows. Horny House of Horror, 2010. Before he gets married, a young man is taken to a brothel by his two friends. Much pain awaits them. Kaiden Horror Classics Film Franchise from 2010. This is four different films. The Arm. A man borrows a woman's arm for the evening and some bizarre events transpire. The Whistler. Set in 1937, this is about two sisters who live with their father deep in the forest, with the older sister caring for the younger one. The Nose. This is about a monk who wanders the wilderness because of his facial deformity. A huge, nasty-looking nose. The Days After. A portrait of the love and grief two parents feel for their late child, whose spirit wanders home on a regular basis to spend time with them. X Game 2010. A group of people are forced to torture one another by playing X Game, which is a game of chance for which each round results in one player being tortured in some hideous fashion by the other contestants. Tomio, 2011. One day, a young man visits the house of a fortune teller with his girlfriend, but he falls for the woman's charms and subsequently develops a bizarre, painful medical condition. Henge, 2011. A housewife must deal with her husband's nightmare seizures that are causing him to lose his grip on humanity. And not only that, his body is also transforming into a monster. Deathpenalty.com 1 and 2 Six people meet on the internet. One is chosen by the site manager and the other five members work together to murder the chosen one's target. They take turns until everyone's target is dead. Lost Harmony 2011 A group of schoolgirls travel to a mountain resort to practice their choir songs but experience violent accidents and deadly assaults instead. Eiko Eiko Azarak, the first episode of Misa Kuroi. 2011, a crisis occurs at a high school when students fall prey to black magic. Schoolgirl Apocalypse, 2011. After practicing some archery, schoolgirl Sakura finds herself under attack by zombies. Dead Sushi, 2012. As the title implies, the employees and visitors at a desolate hot springs resort are attacked by killer pieces of zombie sushi. Torihara Geki Joban, 2012, an anthology of short films that revolve around people who are tormented by mentally unhinged stalkers. Lesson of the Evil, 2012, a high school teacher concocts an extreme plan to deal with the rise of bullying and bad behavior among the student body. It's a Beautiful Day, 2013. While visiting California, a group of international students are targeted by two homicidal burglars. Grateful Dead, 2013. A lonely girl becomes a stalker of other lonely people and eventually becomes obsessed with an elderly man. Miss Zombie, 2013. The protagonist in this film is a female zombie who lives in a reality where zombie infections have many different stages, and full-blown zombie transformations take years to complete. Hanadama, Origins, 2014. A schoolgirl is relentlessly bullied by fellow students and teachers, which leads to a violent conclusion. Fires on the Plain, 2014. About a Japanese soldier who endures illness, starvation, and brutality in the Philippines at the tail end of World War II. Mother, 
2014. This is the story of manga artist Kazuo Umezu, which mixes reality and fiction as it shows the relationship between him and his mother. A Record of Sweet Murder, 2014. A young journalist agrees to interview her acquaintance, a man who recently escaped a psych psychiatric facility and murdered 18 people. As the Gods Will, 2014. Japan has been visited by godlike beings that have targeted high schools for experimentation. Consequently, a young man and his classmates must outwit these sadistic Japanese deities in a series of deadly games. Puzzle, 2014. Teachers and students are terrorized by a series of attacks, which force them to find puzzle pieces in order to save their fellow students from impending death. Parasite, Part 1 and 2, 2014 and 2015. Worm-like creatures appear on Earth, take over human brains, and kill other humans for food. I Am a Hero, 2015. A mysterious zombie virus suddenly spreads throughout Japan, causing widespread panic. An underachieving manga assistant gets caught up in the chaos, so he, re he requests assistance from his trusty shotgun. Tag, 2015. A schoolgirl witnesses the mass execution of her classmates by an apparently unnatural force, but becomes confused when faced with subsequent events. Attack on Titan, the movie, 2015. A medieval-like world of humans has become almost completely extinct due to the ar arrival of bloodthirsty, vicious humanoid giants. Bloody Chainsaw Girl, 2016. A chainsaw-wielding high school girl battles against a demented classmate named Nero, who transforms schoolgirls into zombie cyborgs. Hanadama Phantom, 2016. A projectionist at a movie theater is drawn to a girl and arrives on the riverside. His lost memory then comes back to him. Meatball Machine Kodoku, 2017. Aliens invade the planet and begin to destroy human life. It's up to Yuji to save the one he loves in a city full of monsters. And with all that said, this list still does not include every single Japanese non-horror film that I've seen. And I'm certainly not going to do additional research on the Japanese non-ghost horror films that I have not yet seen because we could be here all night. I mean, the purpose for compiling the aforementioned list is to give you a sampling, a nice sampling of films so you can comprehend the production trends of an industry that allegedly collapsed over a decade ago. But even with the sampling method, it still feels like I'm beating a dead horse. Now, there are so many films here, it would demand a significant time investment to actually sit down and watch them all. In fact, most movie fans wouldn't even bother to watch this many Japanese horror films in their entire life. So why does everyone just assume that the Japanese horror film industry fell off a cliff during the early 2000s? Well, I'll kick off my answer by asking you a question. What Japanese horror film from the 2010s has been covered the most on the internet? Just think about it for a second. From what I've seen, it's probably Sadako vs. Kayako. Now, I briefly surfed YouTube and found 52 trailer reaction videos to that film. 52! And all of this for a movie that features not one, but two. Onryo Ghosts, you know, the cliche that everyone likes to complain about and make fun of. Meanwhile, we have a more unorthodox film in Miss Zombie, and I could not find a single trailer reaction for that film at all. Not even one. Now, what I'm trying to say here, and what I'm, what I'm actually saying may sound crazy to some of you, but Miss Zombie exists regardless of whether or not its trailer is trending on YouTube. In like manner, Japanese horror is much more than the small handful of ghost films that everyone decided to watch over 10 years ago. I see people make, th make this mistake all of the time. They focus on the most popular films, and then they just assume that nothing else exists. If there's no hype behind it, then it's not, not worth acknowledging, really. Its existence doesn't matter. You know, unfortunately, this kind of logic is completely unacceptable in the internet age, you know, especially when we consider the fact that the vast majority of the films in my aforementioned list have had official releases on DVD or legitimate streaming sites with English subtitles. There are a small handful that are hard to find. They were previously released in Japan without subs, but 
they were actually enjoyable regardless. <clears throat> but my point here is that we need to stop being so lazy when talking about the industry trends of Japanese cinema. Because 99% of the people out there do not have enough knowledge to correct us when we're wrong about something. You know, on the other hand, you know, if we make an ignorant or deluded criticism about American cinema, there's a good chance that a well-informed person is going to hear it and correct us on it. That is certainly not the case with Japanese cinema, which means that there are all kinds of ridiculous misrepresentations of the industry floating around out there, and it needs to stop. But are any of the films in my aforementioned lists actually worth watching? I'm sure some of you are like chomping at the bit to ask me that question. You know, are any of the films on, on your aforementioned lists worth my time? Are any of them as good as something like Ring or Dark Water? My answer to both of these questions is an emphatic yes. Yes, there is. There are films on those lists that I just gave you that I think are utterly fantastic. Fantastic. There are also a few that I think are terrible, by the way. I mean, let's be honest. There's some crap on the list I just gave you, okay? But in my opinion, there are a bunch of films on those aforementioned lists that are really impressive and arguably better than some of the popular Japanese horror films that came out during the, the alleged heyday of the industry. However, we need to stay focused here on the task at hand in this video. Remember, I'm specifically responding to the oft-parroted claim that the Japanese horror film industry suffers from a severe lack of creativity, and that the industry is oversaturated with ghost films, and uh, filmmakers are failing miserably to create much of anything outside of that narrow subgenre. This is more of an objective look at the industry's production trends, right? Uh, and again, it's independent regarding you know how many of those aforementioned films we actually enjoy. If you want a discussion regarding the quality of those films, check out my Asian horror playlist, which I link in the description box. And yes, I am planning on doing you know more of these discussion videos like this one, one of which in the future is going to compare the overall quality and entertainment value of Asian horror films from the early 2000s to those from recent years. And I'm going to take more of a subjective approach to that video, and I'm going to expand my focus to all of East Asia instead of just to, just Japan. And I hope to you know eventually finish that video maybe later this year or early next year. So look out for that. But before we wrap up this section of the discussion, let me ask you another related question. Of those 52 trailer reaction videos that I found for Sadako vs. Kayako, how many of those YouTubers do you think actually bothered to watch the movie and post a review? Just take a wild guess. So, out of the 52 trailer reactions, only two of those particular channels actually decided to watch the film and post a review, despite the fact that most of them had positive things to say about the trailer. That's less than 4%. But Eric, you might ask, what does that have to do with anything that we're talking about tonight? You know, what are you talking about? Well, let me tell you. And what I'm about to say may sound crazy, but, you know, maybe we should actually sit down and watch the movies before having an opinion about the industry. I know, it's crazy. It sounds like a crazy idea. And this goes beyond the trailer reaction stuff. And I was just using it as an example. But my point is aimed at people who, who like to just claim that the Japanese horror film industry was at its peak during the early or the late 90s and early 2000s. But how is anyone supposed to make that determination if you have not seen a bunch of the movies that I've listed out in this video? I know this is a little bit of a side note to our main topic here, which you know, is the objective fact that Japan has produced a lot of non-ghost films, regardless of whether or not you like them. But I just wanted to give a helpful reminder that we are obligated to watch a bunch of these movies before we choose to assess the industry as a whole in terms of its overall quality across time, right? If you want, if you want to just watch a few Japanese horror movies here and there and have opinions about those, that's fine. But if you want to you know, make wide, clean proclamations about the industry or what the industry is producing, you got to stay informed, right? So let's wrap up this section of the discussion and return to the questions that I posed at the start of the video. Number one, is Japanese horror dead? No. Number two, what happened to Japanese horror films? Well, as I mentioned plenty of times in my Asian horror playlist on this YouTube channel, Japan has made a variety of horror films over the last 60 years. And as we've seen in this video, 
Japan has continued to make a variety of horror films during the last dozen or so years. Number three, why is there no diversity in the Japanese horror film industry since they just keep producing films about ghost girls with wet hair over their faces? Well, contrary to what many people believe, Japan has produced a plethora of non-ghost horror films during the 21st century. So this is an indisputable fact at this point, right? So there you have it. And you know, with all this talk about the death of J-horror, the thing that really needs to die, the thing that really does need to die, is this constant misrepresentation of the Japanese film industry that's based on insufficient sample sizes and lack of research. So let's move to section two of this video now. Now I'm going to discuss the death of J-horror Midnight Eye article in general and respond to a variety of statements within it, almost all of which relate specifically to the Japanese horror film industry. So grab a hot coffee and stick around because we have some more interesting stuff to talk about regarding Japanese horror. Now this Death of J-Horror article is 12 pages long, if you were to print it out, and is essentially broken up into four major sections. An Introduction A History of Japanese Horror in Literature, Arts, and Manga A History of Japanese Horror in Film And a Discussion of Contemporary Japanese Horror in Film So the title of this article is The Death of J-Horror, but the writer only uses approximately 4 out of 12 pages to argue this point. And as we've previously seen, it's a remarkably unconvincing argument. Now while reading the article, it becomes clear that this writer wants to establish the fact that Japanese horror has been around for many decades in various forms. And he does a good job of summarizing things. You know, I think this article is worth reading for his historical discussions alone. Because there's a lot of people out there who apparently think that Japan did not produce horror films prior to Ring's release in 1998. And then you could check out my Asian horror playlist as well on this YouTube channel because I covered over 100 Japanese horror films that were released before 1998. The year that is generally considered to be the birth of contemporary Japanese horror. The problem is that much of his discussion in this article on those historical topics does nothing to support his insinuation that Japanese horror is dying or already dead. Even worse, the four pages that he actually dedicates to his argument are rather unfocused. So let's go through some additional statements and arguments that we could find in this article. Ah yes, J-horror. Everyone knows its tropes by now. Vengeful ghosts, long stringy black hair, impossible physical gymnastics, meowing little ghost boys, cursed videos, or cell phones or computers, old rotted buildings and corpses, moldy books and newspapers, elliptical, elliptical storylines, or the total abandonment of logic, creepy sound design and creepy cinematography. Then there's the bizarrely happy endings and, lest we forget, the saccharine pop songs. j Hor, as it is called, is a clever appellation for what is in reality only a very thin sliver of the Japanese horror genre that has been produced since the mid-90s. Now you see, I always thought that J-horror was simply shorthand for Japanese horror. And I'm not sure why someone would arbitrarily restrict the definition to contemporary Japanese ghost films with specific characteristics like vengeful ghosts, meowing little ghost boys, uh, stuff like that. When discussing J-horror films on message boards over the years, you know, older films such as Quieten, Onibaba, and Tetsuo the Iron Man were frequently referenced in those discussions. Now when I see a message board post or a YouTube comment that mentions J-horror, it's almost always used to criticize or compliment the Japanese horror film industry in its totality. And I can guarantee you that almost every single person who clicked on this video or the Midnight Eye article did so with that definition in mind. So again, I fundamentally disagree with this author's definition of the term J-horror because it's unnecessarily restrictive, misleading, and completely lacking in common sense and practicality. Then he, after defining it this way, and Tom Mess in future articles, uses this artificially narrow-minded definition of J-horror to argue that there's no variety and that we should be doing something different, folks. So when something different like Strange Circus or Rampo Noir comes out, that doesn't count as J-horror per se, because it's really an Iroguro film instead. Okay. But what about Audition? It's certainly not a ghost film, but
but virtually everyone classifies it as a J-horror film, right? Which will certainly cause confusion for reader, readers of this article. But, but don't worry, you know, because the author uses the following mental gymnastics to get around this, this problem. While a strong argument exists that Miki's audition is not J-horror, in the Shinri Mano sort of way, but rather dark psychological horror, I feel that this defining of genre comes down to whether or not a film has a listed J-horror cliches. So that's a great idea, right? Let's define J-horror using a refined list of cliches, and then turn right around and complain that all these films are cliched. It's essentially a self-fulfilling pop prophecy, right? Any film that falls outside of this like tiny little conceptual box will be classified as something else, like dark psychological horror or ero guru horror. Can anyone explain to me how this definition of J-horror makes any sense whatsoever? And did you catch that important wording that I quoted earlier? Let me quote it again. J-horror, as it is called, is a clever appellation for what is in reality only a very thin sliver of the Japanese horror genre that has been produced since the mid-1990s. So if these ghost films that everyone is complaining about really only represent a very thin sliver of horror films that are produced in Japan, then it must mean that there are plenty of other kinds of horror films out there to watch and from Japan. So really, what is this article complaining about? You see, this is what I'm talking about when I say that this article, as well as Midnight Eye's argumentation over the years regarding Japanese horror, are incredibly confusing and headache-inducing. You know, two paragraphs into the article, and it already doesn't make any sense. But even if this definition of J-horror is unnecessarily restrictive, one of the main ports, points of this article, which I have not yet addressed, by the way, is that the Japanese ghost film, specifically, is essentially dead. You know, the writer even takes it a step further and makes the following statement, which is rather bold. But we're talking about Japan here, and let me tell you a little secret. The new Japanese wave of horror was dead in Japan by 2000. Well, this is what Tom Mess was referring to also in his book Reagitator when he said that J-horror has died its second death. So I guess the Japanese ghost film apparently died around the year 2000 or something, then got a slight kick in the butt from international interest, and quickly died again and never recovered. So let's play by their rules, and challenge ourselves a little bit. Was the Japanese ghost film really dead back in 2000, and is it still dead today? Now what I'm about to propose here is going to be a more subjective argument, okay? Since the strength of my argument will ultimately depend on how much each individual individual viewer enjoys these you know these movies. So let's take a look at one of the better ghost films, in my opinion, from each calendar year, beginning in 1998. Now, if the Japanese ghost film really died all those years ago, this should not this should turn out to be a really pathetic list of terrible films. And be sure to check out my Asian horror playlist for my reviews of each of these films. Alright. In 1998, we got Ring, which is a contemporary classic. In 1999, we got Gakko no Kaiden 4, also known as Haunted School 4, which is another fantastic film. In 2000, we got Juon the Curse, which is the original made-for-television installment of this franchise. Another very impressive film that is seriously spooky. In 2001, we got Pulse, also known as Cairo which is one of the best ghost films ever made from any country. So let me tell you a little secret. The Japanese ghost film was alive and well after 2000, at the very least. In 2002, we got Dark Water, which I think is a good film, but many critics and fans believe it to be another contemporary classic. In 2003, we got Juon the Grudge 2, which is my personal favorite of this particular franchise. And as we'll see later in this video, the writer of this article actually agrees with me on this point. In 2004, we got Premonition, which is a fine film. Nothing great, in my opinion, but good stuff for sure. In 2005, we got Noroi, also known as The Curse, which is the single greatest found footage horror film ever made, in my opinion. It scared the living crap out of me. And yet again, I marvel at how anyone could possibly think that Japanese horror was dead in 2005. In 2006, we got Retribution, another fantastic film by, by Kayoshi Kurosawa. In 2007, we got Hair Extensions, a surprisingly solid ghost film, despite its nutty premise. 
In 2008, we got Carved 2, The Scissors Massacre, a film that is easily superior to its predecessor and very well made all around. In 2009, we got Hide and Go Kill 2, Creepy Hide and Seek, a glacially paced creep fest that I enjoyed quite a bit, but I seem to be in the minority with that opinion. In 2010, we got Kyofu, also known as The Sylvian Experiments, which is the least impressive film in this J-horror theater film series. It has a number of flaws and weaknesses. There was definitely a scarcity of Japanese ghost films during 2010, making it an unusually weak year for these kinds of films. In 2011, we got Gomenasai, also known as Ring of Curse, a solid film that explores the idea of a curse in different ways. In 2012, we got Kotsutsubo, which is a good flick, nothing great, but effective stuff. In 2013, we got Cult, which I think is a very interesting found footage horror film that is also fun to watch. In 2014, we got Zero, Fatal Frame, a legitimately impressive high quality film by any standard. And in 2015, we got The Inerasable, a proficiently made creep fest that will please most fans of this kind of film. That seems like a pretty solid lineup of Japanese ghost films, in my opinion. I mean, heck, I would say that four of the last five films that I listed from 2011 to 2015 are very interesting and strongly recommendable. And the lineup leading to the date of this Death of J-Hor article, December 22, 2005, was Ring, Gakko no Kaiden 4, Juon the Curse, Pulse, Dark Water, Juon the Grudge 2, Premonition, and Noroi. What is this guy complaining about? I mean, after watching these films, as well as you know some others that I did not uh, include in this list for the sake of brevity, uh, I'm convinced the Japanese ghost film was alive and well in 2005, and has made some strong contributions up to the present day. And I'll say it again, you know, if you've seen all of these movies, and you simply did not enjoy most of them, it's perfectly fine. You got no problem with that. It's completely, a completely legitimate opinion to have. And the fact that you actually took the time to watch them is commendable. But if you're going to sit there and tell me that you know, all these films are the same and are simply Z-rated knockoffs of Ring, I'm going to tell you to watch them again and actually pay attention this time. Now at this point in the article, it goes through the history of Japanese horror in various forms. So we'll, we'll jump ahead to page 9 here. There are some very interesting entries into the horror and J-horror canon after the ring and spiral roared through, the aforementioned Kyoshi Kurosawa film Cure being a great example. But even the double feature sequel to the ring and spiral, Ring 2 and Shikoku, felt a little belabored. While Cure is actually my favorite Japanese film of all time, outstanding stuff, the film Spiral that is referenced here is better known by its alternate title Raisin to international audiences, I actually prefer Ring 2 and Shikoku over Raisin. I mentioned in my Asian Horror playlist that, uh, you know, my video from 98, that Raisin just felt kind of like a hot mess to me, because either the scriptwriters or the novelists attempted to rewrite character motives from the Ring for the purpose of shoehorning new ideas into the story of Raisin. So, you know, consequently, I thought that Raisin was very badly written. And although Ring 2 and Shikoku have their flaws, I feel like the positives outweigh the negatives in those. However, the theatrical ring film from 98 is the best in this particular franchise. By the early 2000s, the phenomenal failure of films like Joji Ida's Another Heaven, Masatu Harada's Inugami, and Kiyoshi Kurosawa's Pulse, Cairo, were a shock to the studios, and yet they weren't to the general public. But if the studios had paid attention, they would have seen that the writing was on the wall. General theater attendance was slumping, and people were tired of the horror cliches. I mean, how many times can you see ghost women that look like they had just jumped out of a very cold shower and really care? Alright, <clears throat> so first of all, Another Heaven is not a Shinri Mano Ega. It's about two detectives who attempt to solve a series of bizarre murders where the killer extracts the brains of the victims and makes food out of them. And from what I remember... There were no ghost women that looked like they had just jumped out of a very cold shower in that film either. In fact, the nature of the villain in Another Heaven is pretty darn cool and creative when it's ultimately revealed. So, 
why is this article drawing parallels between another heaven and unreal ghost films? I mean, the comparison is nonsensical. Also, Pulse is a far different ghost film than a typical Shinri Mano Eiga. You know, it's essentially a philosophical art house style horror film that explores the concept of loneliness. Now check out my review on my Asian horror playlist from 2001 for reasoning why I think it's an utterly fantastic movie and arguably the best Japanese ghost film of all time. And I'm frankly disappointed that this author essentially threw this film under a bus as a generic cash grab. Like, like, uh, like Kayoshi just, uh, you know, just made the film on a whim and just threw a bunch of Sadako clones in there. You know, just to make a quick buck. And it appears that Tom Mess agrees with me on this point because he reviewed Pulse on the Midnight Eye website and had this to say. Pulse is a triumph of effective filmmaking made by a director who should be considered one of the most important filmmakers to work in the horror genre, in Japan or elsewhere. Yeah, I definitely agree with that statement. Now the author of this article goes on to explain <clears throat> that the international demand for Japanese horror spiked after American, the American Ring film, the remake, was released. And this is consistent with what we see in industry trends because the creative and productive explosion of Japanese horror arrived around 2004-2005 six years after the original Ring was released in its home country. A lot of people do not realize this. Now, most people seem to think that once Ring came out in Japan, the floodgates opened, but it's not necessarily the case. Again, check out my Asian Horror playlist for more details on this. I still count Juon 2, the film, not the video release, as one of the best ghost films in recent memory, and while it might not be for everyone, I was totally creeped out by it. I completely agree with this statement. Of all the films in the Juon franchise, I think Juon the Grudge 2 from 2003 is the most purely entertaining film because of its thoughtful screenplay. It's almost like the filmmakers took everything that made Juon the Curse and Juon the Grudge from 2000 and 2002 respectfully great and infused an even greater dose of creativity and cleverness to it. I love that movie. But I have to point out the irony of this author's statement. He thinks that Juon the Grudge 2 is one of the best ghost films in recent memory despite the fact that it's the fourth installment of this franchise. Now, taking the arguments of this Death of J-Horror article into consideration, I can only imagine that these Midnight Eye guys would have told Takashi Shimitsu to stop making Juon films after he made Juon the Curse in 2000. And if he took their advice, we would have been deprived of two of the better ghost films in recent memory. This article then goes on to compliment Shimitsu on his film Maribito, which I agree is excellent stuff. Then the writer goes on to emphasize the importance of exploring new ideas to make a genre survive. After that, he makes the following statements. Horror films in the West can point their fingers at Kevin Williamson as much as they want and blame him for the horror slump of the last part of the 90s and early 2000s. But he was just part of something larger and more lazy that was going on. It's much more easy to be ironic rather than to try to craft actual scares. And it's for this very reason that the first two entries of Ichisei's J-Horror Theater, Infection and Premonition, are particularly frustrating to watch. They're not bad films per se, they're just so mediocre. Alright, there's obviously nothing wrong with disliking those films. He actually watched them and thought that they were mediocre. Fair enough. I wish he would have been a little bit more specific as to why he feels that way, but, you know, again, perfectly legitimate opinion to have. That's, that's the, the, the phrase for the evening. The problem... I have with these statements is that he seems to be drawing a parallel between Kevin Williamson's Scream franchise and the first two installments of this J-Horror Theater movie series. I'm not seeing the connection. You know, Infection and Premonition are not satires, nor are they trying to be ironic or comedic while referencing genre cliches. This is why I'm wary of the J-Horror Theater concept. It seems to be more of the same, aimed at who? Naive fans will gobble down anything with a J-Horror title emblazoned on it. I, for one, am less inclined to see this series precisely because it's called J-Horror Theater. And after watching the first two middling releases, I'm being proven right. More of the same. Infection is not a Shinrei Mano Ega. It's not a vengeful ghost film. Along the lines of like Ringu and Juan. You know, it's a psychological horror film that relies on horrific medical imagery. Not ghost girls with long black hair over their faces. You know, when I think of infection, I think of dead bodies that decompose into smelly green ooze. I mean, how could you not think of that after watching that movie? In fact, the ending of infection is 
surprisingly interesting and thought-provoking. You know, it, it is very ambiguous. It leaves a lot open to interpretation. But uh, the nature of the infection that's revealed later on is one of the uh, coolest concepts that I've seen introduced to a film of this kind. You see, this is kind of like, you know, hand-waving criticism. I frequently hear directed at the Japanese horror film industry, you know, all these movies are the same, yada, yada, yada. It's just lazy film criticism. If you watch and dislike the film, perfectly fine. But saying that infection is the same as Juon is just being disingenuous. But with that said, you know, what about Premonition? Which is about a haunted newspaper of death that communicates future deadly events to our protagonist. Well, from what I remember, there were some ghostly scares that were used in that one, at least more than were in Infection. So there is at least an argument to be made that it is in part a ghost film. There are also some other cliches present, like the protagonist investigating the origin of the curse, etc., which you frequently see in ghost films, right? I do not think that the argument is entirely convincing, but I can understand someone drawing some parallels with Japanese ghost films, right? And uh, that's why I included it on my prior list. However, I do think that it's a well-made, entertaining movie that contributes some memorable sequences that help to carve out its own identity. I find the film to be very memorable. You know, at the very least, it's that much. It's not just a ring clone, you know what I mean? How are you supposed to find a gem like Sogo Ishii's 1994 Angel Dust if you have to dig through generic genre clerk crap? Flooding the market is bad for the industry and the viewer. Both loyal hardcore fans and the precious new viewers are going to be driven away. Horror as a genre is never meant to be for everyone, nor is J-horror. Stop trying to dilute it for the masses. In a totally inundated market, the wheat doesn't always separate from the chaff. Well, my aforementioned recommend recommendation list from 2005 includes 18 titles <clears throat> that did not revolve around ghosts. I saw an additional 12 Japanese horror films from 2005 that were not included on that list. So that means that of the 30 or so Japanese horror films that I saw from 2005, at least 60% of them were not ghost films. And I probably could have classified more of them as non-ghost films. I mean, would you consider Tomie to be a ghost? I wouldn't. I'd consider it to be a, a demon in human form. So if you exclude both of the Tomie films from 2005, our percentage starts to approach 70%. It starts to, to tickle the 70% mark. And I could go even higher with some additional argumentation on my end. So is it really that hard to find Japanese horror films that do not revolve around ghosts? I think not. Try something different, folks. Maybe start by adding some young blood? Use writers from outside of the genre? Or better yet, filmmakers from the independent film world? You know, if you don't believe me on this, then I recommend taking a look at Fruit Chan's brilliant 2004 film, Dumplings, starring Bai Ling. Yeah, I know. I mean, it's not like there's a glaring example of this in Japanese horror cinema. You ever hear of a little director by the name of Shion Sono? You know, the guy who directed Suicide Club in 2002 and Strange Circus in 2005. Well, he was making indie dramas for years before making the transition to horror films. So you see, you know, analyzing this article is really helpful because it gives us some insight into the plethora of illogical argumentation that is frequently aimed at the Japanese horror film industry. You know, if I tried to criticize any other writing from the Midnight Eye contributors, either on the website or in their books, I would have difficulty finding any errors or weak arguments at all. They're that good. But for some reason, they just do not give a rat's ass about Japanese horror. Their writings on the horror film industry are filled with holes, like lazy argumentation, stereotypes, and of course, lethargic hand-waving dismissals of the entire industry. It's really disappointing considering, you know, that all of their other stuff is so fantastic. But that's the situation that we're currently faced with. You know, that's what this video is all about. Almost everyone approaches Japanese horror in this way. And consequently, you know, Japan's contributions to horror cinema over the past 20 years is very under underappreciated. It really is. In fact, I would say that Japan's contributions to cinema as a whole during the last 20 years is severely underappreciated. And that's one of the reasons why I started this YouTube channel. So, I mean, that's it. That's all I got for you tonight. I hope this video was somewhat informative for those who decided to watch it. I'm wondering if anyone decided to watch it this far, but whatever. And yes, I definitely plan on making another opinion piece video that compares the Asian horror film industry from recent years 
to the industry of the early 2000s. And you might be surprised at some of the findings that I have. So look out for that later this year or maybe early next year. I definitely want to do more of these kinds of videos in the future because it's kind of fun and I think it's, it's pretty informative. And this is kind of what I want to do for this channel. I like doing individual movie reviews a lot. But the whole point of me starting this channel is to give people a panoramic insight into the industries as a whole. The type of movies they produce. And to kind of, I don't know, I guess I would say respond to a lot of the misrepresentations out there. So, as always, I'll see you next time.